Uh, so, yeah, you guys all showed up for uh, basically us setting up the AV stuff pretty quick. And uh, yeah, this is next gen hacking ATMs. So, and I'm going to jackpot this little baby. It has $50,000 in it. So, it should be shooting all over the floor in a little bit. And uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm a, a senior engineer, been doing pen testing for about 11 years. I speak a lot. Uh, spoke a lot at DEF CON. Uh, this is my third year in a row at DEF CON, so I just love the conventions, love meeting the people. And I spoke at Hope, uh, Takedown CON, tons of other events. So, and I d did a lot of reverse engineering. I'm doing a talk later this week or on uh, the demo labs on some uh, software that actually makes computers immune to ransomware. So I don't only do terrible things to ATMs, I also try to make protections too. So, and I did a lot of hotel hacking. It's going to be on uh, also later this week on Sunday. If you want to make sure your talks on the last day of the week, make sure you do it on hacking uh, hotels. So, <laughs> and yeah, safety first. Uh, I drove an ATM machine about 1,900 miles uh, from Bismarck, North Dakota, to Las Vegas, Nevada, and I had, uh, once again, I had an ATM machine and a bunch of skimmers, shimmers, everything you can imagine. So that was one of the things I took safety first, and actually didn't push the firmware on the devices until I actually got to my hotel room at Mandalay Bay because I did this at Black Hat also. So that's something where I liked. To take a little bit more safety precautions just when you're moving those things, because I know in the past a lot of people have, uh, you know, accidentally forgot them in airplanes or, uh, you know, had their vehicles broken into. So I just did a little bit more dil due diligence and, uh, yeah, just thought that was kind of, kind of neat. I wish more people would do that because some of these things, if they fall into the wrong hands, um, it's kind of scary to imagine what people would do with them. So, and yeah, uh, I'm going to go over the actual attacks on the EMV. Uh, some of them are standards based. Some of the things are um, things that weren't fixed in the past um, from some of the talks previously. So hopefully you guys have a little bit of a uh, understanding at least of what the chip and pin cards are. Uh, if you if you bank somewhere where they still have the mag stripes, I would uh, <laughs> maybe take a consideration into changing that. So and yeah, they're working through a lot of the card stock. So everything in the uh, United States is going to be chip and pin here pretty soon. So they have the next liability shift that's coming up in 2017. So. And uh, that's what makes this a next gen talk. Actually, I converted this uh, ATM machine uh, over to EMV, so which I'll go into a little bit details here. So a tour of the actual dis distribution system. So I have an actual blockchain design that I imagine that the uh, it actually makes it possible. Uh, you know, it's not actually enabling people, but it shows the capabilities of the extent that the bad guys are actually going to go to uh, when they actually start. Uh, trying to sell these transactions because the static data, everybody's seen the Carter forms and things I'll get into greater detail later about that. So, and uh, let's see here. So I'm going to look at the communication back end, um, uh, what the actual uh, banking portion it's running on, things like that. I'm going to introduce you to Lakara, it's the automated cash out me method. And I'm going to go over the uh, demo, which is uh, going in great detail. It's actually going to just jackpot on stage. So. And yeah, so basically, what is EMV? It was uh, integra integrated in the early 80s in France, and uh, it's EarPay MasterCard Visa. And it's a little chip and pin cards. The actual EMV Co is the one that actually monitors the standards for those. So uh, yeah, it replaces the MagStrip card, which has been around since the 1940s, so it's a little old. It could have uh, participated in World War II, so that is pretty old. Uh, yeah, liability shift actually on uh, gas pumps, which is the bad guy's favorite shimming and skimming spots. Is actually going to be coming up here in 2017 for gas pumps and point of sale systems, or the uh, gas pump and uh, ATM machines. So that's why the, I thought this talk was due. I'd like to give the good guys a little bit of time to actually, uh, yeah, fix some of these issues before they're actually used out in the wild. Because as soon as the mag strip data are cut off, they're going to have about $40 of value. So, and what actually led me to this research is I have a ton of scripts that I have a. Uh, running online and they're actually monitoring bin numbers and uh, some of the bank identification numbers that are for sale. So if there's a larger breach in uh, say for example like Bismarck, North Dakota or something like that, it'll, you know, it'll show that there's uh, high validity or there have a lot of cards for sale in the North Dakota area which I'll show you. And this is kind of how they offer it now. It was one of the biggest breakthroughs that happened in uh, carding history in the last little bit uh, was pretty much over the last four or five years people have been able to literally filter by your area code. Like I live in Bismarck, North Dakota. And these are all uh, tr credit card transactions that wouldn't raise any suspicion if I was the bad guy. So that's like one of the bigger things that hit the, this is how it evolved. Like before it was, you know, you didn't know if you were buying an Austin, Texas credit card or the bad guy didn't know if he was buying a, a bad credit card. So where it would get flagged for suspicion. So, so I actually took a, a kind of an approach on what I imagined some of the next generation sales methods would be and uh, how people would actually be able to sell EMV transactions and um, some of the uh, RFID and actually uh, the old classic track one, two, and three data. And uh, as you guys have probably seen, um, they have professionally made shimmers out there now. Like a lot of them actually have like serial numbers and stuff on them. So they are actually being prof 
professionally produced and uh, that's something that, uh, yeah, this is pretty much going to take a little bit of a glimpse into the actual, uh, what I imagine future Carter sites would look like. Uh, being able to sell the EMV transactions which aren't static, da static data so they're not something where you can buy it and use it in a week and a half. It's literally, uh, as you'll see on the next page here, it's actually the Carter site of the future. So it has actually complete with spelling errors. So, and yeah, you can basically uh, just select which FEMA region you're going to be in and uh, automated, if it's going to be automated portion, you can push some in additional commands and the actual time zone, uh, it's going to go into setting the fraud SMS system. So that's like something where you can, uh, say for example if on the cash out ATM if people wanted to block the SMS messaging and things like that because some of the banks will send the confirm messages and stuff like that so uh, there's a lot of uh, actual attack surface that people can do with these so. And uh, you're going to basically put in two passwords and I'll go into a little bit of detail what those actually do later on in this uh, transaction and uh, yeah. And I trust that this will make a lot more sense once I actually show you guys the blockchain. So yeah you're basically not buying static data anymore you're buying access or the bad guys are actually buying access to a network of shimmed devices where those devices are passing the information off to the cash out ATM. So, and yeah, here's how it works actually. So that person that was going through the bad Carter site, so Mr. Bad Guy comes onto the page, uh, picks which minute he's going to be doing, uh, standing at that ATM and, uh, you just, uh, he has to select what time zone he was in and some other things. And it'll actually, uh, with one of those two passwords that he did, he'll be able to put in a delimited character where it'll be able to pick out where that transaction is. So that you're getting a blockchain. Every single fraudulent transaction that is going on in this shim network, um, I have, there's like 150,000 bank accounts, uh, that are simulated on this back end. Then, um, there's a credit processor portion where all the, cr the fraud flags are held and things. So it will actually go through the transactions here in a little bit. So this is actually going to pass off into the blockchain pretty much all of the 35 devices that is feeding this ATM machine. So, uh, for since the 27th of last month, I've actually had a lot of transactions going on. So there's little sims that are basically doing purchases and it's learning what a natural environment looks like. And it actually, uh, the in initial time when I ran it, it uh, shut down after seven transactions because I only had 150 accounts. So it actually has the fraud, fl uh, the fraud flags in place to actually shut it down. So. And basically, so after you put the password in, it's actually going to go into uh, giving you the character information you need to initiate the tunnel uh, for the fraudulent backend. So when the bad guys are connecting, they actually get DES keys that allow them to actually talk to the entire fraud backend. So, and this is, um, yeah, this is the first time that they'd be able to monetize this in a, in a live scenario. So. And the information received, so they get the tunnel information before, so they're connecting to the tunnel and authenticating to the fraud network. Uh, pretty much the same way that the ATM has DES keys that talks to the gateway processor that talks to the banking backends. So without the DES keys, this uh, ATM cannot talk to my uh, ga gateway processor network that I've set up, and then also the banking backend or any of the bank accounts. So that's something where uh, your basic, basic information is going to go over the info type quality of the actual skim device. So if it's one of the more trusted sources um, where people paid more, they'll get more preferential treatment on the actual blockchain. So. Yeah, so basically, uh, other than that you're gonna get your tunnel ID information and then you're gonna get pin information and uh, this, this device is actually automatically putting in pin information which is uh, one of the, the last ways that it's actually possible to uh, jackpot uh, additionally because um, like Barnaby Jack uh, was, did some great research, made it a lot easier for people like me to be able to present uh, uh, flaws in ATMs and things like that without being arrested or questioned by law enforcement. So that's something where you know a lot of the front runners, um, his was actually a hardware attack where it actually attacked the firmware, just told it to spit the actual uh, money out. So that's something where this is a little bit different research. So. And yeah, so basically as you can see the connection information is before your actual transaction in the blockchain. So. And what kind of infor information can be sold on these Carter sites? Um, so there's basically static magnetic data and track one and two and three data, that's the classic data that's being sold right now. There's EMV, DDA, which is the dynamic uh, authentication which are some of the newer cards. Um, if you got like one of the cards like three years ago, four years ago, some of those had a lot more static information on them and uh, some of the newer card stocks that banks are going through are the new, these new two, new two transactions. So some of the issues that were, you know, spoke of in the past were actually fixed a little bit and uh, some of them were, were still available. So some of the newer uh, cards are still susceptible to these attacks. And uh, there will be some RFID stuff. So not the RFID in the sense of like the Apple Pay and the Google Pay. Uh, it's actually the t uh, cards where you can click them and stuff like that. Though some of those will be able to be, would be able to be sold on a fraudulent network. So, 
And yeah, it actually, the, this device will, if they're not, f uh, I put a couple cards in there when I remove them for demo purposes. But uh, that were like specifically only for food or things like that. So it'll reject cards onto the network that are just set for flags that say it can only be used for food or gas. So, and uh, aside from the card actually being passed off, it'll also pass off the pin and the ATM limit. And that's one of the things that uh, while I was going around some of those Carter sites, I was uh, collecting a lot of research, and there was lots of um, pans. Uh, they were collecting the actual pan information, so the account numbers and the bins, which are the bank identification numbers. They were collecting the amounts that were most likely their point of sale limits and then some of their ATM transactions. So it's something where they were looking to see how much these actual accounts they could get out of them so they'd know what to mark them up to. But it's also uh any time that they would compromise a card uh using like a, a Lebanese loop or there's other devices where they would get them stuck in the ATM come back for them. Um they were most likely you know taking these cards and looking actually actual flag details so they're collecting all this information from the banking networks and that's what led me to believe that uh eventually they're going to be going after EMV transactions but why would they do it now? Because they have all this low hanging fruit of all these magnetic card data. So, anyway, here's in a nutshell what is happening. You have multiple shimmed devices and they're passing off to one device. So, this doesn't have to be in a huge blockchain. Uh, that was the method that I saw is where bad guys would be able to monetize this again. And it's because of some of the latency uh, that is introduced into the actual process. Um, there's limitations with the, especially the uh, backbone for fiber inside the United States. There's some methods where they could uh, actually be able to do online processing all the time and some of the weaknesses that are in these actual protocols that were exploited uh, won't be able to be fully turned on for a couple of years due to limitations on actual communication networks. So, but uh, basically think of it as, you know, if one bad guy actually poisoned four uh, ATMs or point of sale systems, they'd be able to uh, relay those uh, EMV transactions into the actual uh, ATM, so. And here's the most likely method that the data gets sold. Uh, so basically you have least gear, so there's people that would be mules for these organizations and they would be, you know, installing these shimmers driving across the United States. Uh, then you have the uh, fraudulent employees, uh, pretty much the same methods that they're using now. Uh, you have the independent small breaches, things like that, where they're, they're uh, fed into a small Carter site. And uh, those were the ones where, you know, the small organizations were people are actually able, you know, there's like a five person crew going around the United States, you know, cashing out that way, so. And when they have unused transactions, they're actually able to pop them into the main Carter sites. And that's kind of the same way it works now, except for they're uh, able to do it with these live EMV transactions. And like it's saying, it can't be held as static data. It needs to be used within a certain time frame and uh, it needs to match some of the flags that it has coming over the top of it for when the uh, transaction is actually initiated, so. Yeah, and so basically this is what happens. Uh, yeah, some people ask me if it's actually cloning the card. It's actually not. It's, uh, what it is, is it's basically intercepting after a certain portion. Uh, initially it's just using the actual power from the point of sale system. And after that point, uh, once it gets the transaction actually started, which I'll go through the actual uh, process, then we'll get into the actual mechanics behind this and the actual uh, shimmers, so. So basically it holds for round two, uh, once it's uh, started the initial process, it uses the power to actually power the skimmer, or the shimmer, and the actual uh, wireless inside the device. So the actual stage one transaction, once it's passed off to the ATM machine, they just did the $38 point of sale transaction, and the uh, $1,500 ATM withdrawal happened without them even being the wiser, and they didn't touch each other's limits, because there's point of sale and ATM, so. And like I said, this is not cloning the card, and uh, there are four stages of the EMV transaction. It's being released into the tunnel and it is literally, imagine it as an extension to the actual ATM. So, uh, the cache, uh, the cache device, uh, basically regurgitates the exact same information that is sent from the shimmed point of sale system. And I will go into a little bit more detail about some of the ways to actually capture pins. Uh, you guys have seen a lot of them in the wild. Um, for example, uh, there's pin overlays. I have a new one that's actually pretty, pretty decent here. So, and, uh, the actual point of sale limit is shimmed. And that won't uh, count once again against the ATM limit. So uh, they actually have different process portions that they're talking to about authentication. So it's a little bit harder to catch some of these transactions also. So, and uh, here's a, a little bit of the pictures of some of the skimmers and shimmers that were uh, caught in the wild. The one up in the left actually was used for some downgrade attacks for some banks that had improperly uh, integrated EMV. And uh, some of the other ones are some of the uh, phone parts and things like that that I actually used to build some of the shimmers that I was actually doing for my proof of concept. So. And yeah, your general point of sale system, so. 
And uh, yeah, cash out device standalone. So yeah, uh, this is meant to be like an out of service ATM. It's supposed to be something that uh, you know normally you wouldn't want it to fly out everywhere on the street, but it's something where you would want to you know catch it and have it doing after hours if it, if you are a bad person, of course. And it's something that uh, I uh, the original con concept that I had um, was just like a huge fascia on the actual ATM, and it would catch all the money and stuff. But it's much better if it's just flying out of the bottom. So. And yeah, and I'm gonna go into the actual cash out standalone. Uh, this is something that people were wondering about because it's, uh, yeah, there's foreign object detection on a lot of the new ones. Um, I found for several ways to actually deactivate a lot of that stuff and uh, some of the newer devices uh, inside the next generation ATMs. So that's something that I'll go into a little bit more detail here. And basically, this is like the standalone device. You just literally need a cell phone and a, or the bad guy only needs a cell phone and a credit card that can impersonate some of the other EMV transactions. So basically, once this device is actually uh, plugged into the machine, it'll start replicating a lot of the information that they're getting from their blockchain. So pretty much all they need is a wireless internet connection and uh, an ATM that accepts, uh, yeah, EMV transactions. So, and I'm going to introduce Lacara, which is uh, r roughly translated the face. So, because everything sounds more menacing in Spanish, doesn't it? So, <laughs> but yeah, no. Uh, why would somebody want to automate something like this? Um, yeah, people are untrustable, as you can see. Uh, this was off of a couple guys' Twitter feeds that got busted. Uh, they were doing a cash out run. Yeah, that's not uh, conspicuous at all. So, <laughs> yeah, so the cash out crews, they're bragging about it on social media. Uh, yeah, when busted, humans get busted, they rat out. And uh, machi machines usually don't have Twitter accounts. That's like one of the most positive things for the bad guys. So, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to go with the DEF CON theme this year, which was uh, Rise of the Machines. Like immediately after Jeff told everybody what the theme was for the next year, I was like, I'm gonna make an ATM machine that can do its own, like, fraud. It'll be a beautiful thing, so. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so going along with the theme, uh, like I was saying, there is the standalone, which would be more practical, and what I actually imagine the bad guys using in the wild, so. And Lakar does have its own Twitter account, actually, so. <laughs> and I was actually gonna broadcast the, uh, the uh, uh, simulated and emulated uh, uh, banking backend transaction data. I didn't have time to set all that up, and I doubt that anyone would have watched a bunch of numbers fly across Twitter when I thought about it in hindsight. So, but yeah, it would have shown a lot of how the staging works and uh, how what will happen if like two transactions are kicked into the blockchain, how they take priority, and a lot of that information. So, so yeah, uh, that guy smiling like a child inside the reflection of that ATM screen is me. Uh, that's <laughs> last year after DEF CON, I actually bought an ATM machine and started doing some research. And uh, everybody asks me, including the press person who violently ripped the <laughs> Lacar off there, what's behind there? And uh, it's actually two Arduinos controlled by a Raspberry Pi controlled by an Android. So there's a lot of computer components and it's uh, basically a bunch of servos uh, that are entering the uh, transaction amount. So it'll say how much money it wants to take out. It'll actually enter the pin number. It'll accept it. It'll say no receipt and then it'll go on to the next transaction. So there's a bunch of little baby robot fingers inside there just pushing buttons and making money come out. And the actual card is actually plugged into the Raspberry Pi and that does all the modulation and uh, the actual data processing for the card. So that's how the actual EMV card, when it gets impersonated, it needed something that's a little more beefy than an Arduino. But as far as for uh, controlling the robot fingers, that was pretty much uh, what it came down to. So, and this could be a removable device, like where if somebody didn't want to, uh, like I was saying, they would most likely want to make it something that pops on quick, that, uh, yeah, is not made out of fiberglass. In, uh, and I'm actually going to go through some of the process of how, yeah, for some reason, you know, you send, uh, I have a couple buddies that do 3D printing and you start sending them ATM parts and uh, they quit answering your emails. So, <laughs> so that's something where pretty much I was like, okay, I'm going to do this the good old fashioned way. You know, like I used to do a lot of auto restoration when I was little. How hard could this be? So, yeah, I basically uh, covered it in plastic, made a buck mold and a plug mold. And then I uh, just put the, you know, fiberglass, uh, yeah, the fiberglass on the front of it. and. Yeah, this is actually nasty ATM is the name of that uh, color of gray. So, <laughs> and it could have been a little bit closer match, but yeah, you get the gist of it. It's an out-of-service ATM. It wouldn't rise any suspicion. Uh, my actual branch ATM, the bank that I work, or the bank, I don't work at a bank. I work at Rapid7, but, uh <laughs> but the uh, bank that I actually bank at, uh, their ATM was down for two days, and I was the first person to tell them. So, it's not something where out-of-service ATM will rise any suspicion. So, this is, uh, yeah. So basically. Uh, it's the Swiss Army knife. So this is one of the first keypads that I actually started training my Arduino system on. So, and uh, yeah, then I started um, working into some of the more advanced methods, like some of the things that aren't even out yet, and will only be integrated once the United States finally catches up to a lot of the other countries. They'll be able to turn on a lot of these mechanisms because I didn't want to just inject 
magnetic card data uh, using like a mag spoofer like Sammy Camcar has. Like that's an amazing device and uh, the, that man is a brilliant genius. I just want to give him props for I do use mag spoofer on this one and several other ones. So, oh yeah. So, <laughs> and there's one up in the corner. Uh, they're basically a little thing that can speak to the magnetic heads in the readers, but it's a very, very cool uh, video to watch if you guys haven't seen it yet. So, but basically, uh, what I start, one of the other devices I started out with, uh, just to see if this was uh, possible, you know, because it's one thing if it's a theory, and it's another thing when you can actually do it, and it's another thing, you know, when you're able to do it wirelessly in a room, and it's another thing when you can bounce it off of VPS up in Toronto. So, like that kind of latency compared to, you know, what's in a room and what's actually allowed by the standards, um, they actually, you know, planned for a lot of that stuff uh, to actually be stopped. So. But yeah, uh, building your own banking backend. So that's uh, a lot of the actual systems. Like I was saying, uh, there's been since the, uh, I think it's the 17th or the 27th of last month, I've been doing uh, a lot of these transactions, and they're actually doing EMV transactions. Um, like I said, there's 15 bank financial institutions, and it's over uh, uh, 150,000 uh, bank accounts. So those all are signed with uh, card stock, um, and they actually have like a physical attachment to them. So anytime that a card is uh, simulated into the reader, it's gonna check with the bank the exact same the real networks would. It's gonna flag it for fraud. Uh, if I had, like I was saying, when I had 150 accounts, after seven accounts I got uh, flagged for fraud because it was unusual suspicion and it was some of the natural settings on the banking network. But now that I have 150,000 accounts, it uh, opened up to a lot more attacks uh, since I was gonna be doing several demos. So. And each, like I was saying, each one of these is, uh, this, this is signed with DES keys. Uh, so say for example if I get flagged for fraud, this will kick me off of my uh, gateway processor and I won't be able to talk to my bank accounts. So that will end the demo. So <laughs> and I wanted to make it a little more real world because I just didn't want it to, you know, be like a, uh, a bad simulation. Like this one actually has some of the field uh, information where you can actually uh, set some of the flags and uh, yeah, it, uh, it initiates the risk just like it would with any other transaction. So and uh, the skimmer is uh, generated, uh, yeah, it's, it's generating everything it's signing on with. So. And yeah, so here's the EMV transaction. So uh, this is in a nutshell. This is not. Uh, it literally took 1,438 pages for me to fully understand it. So <laughs> this is uh, my two PowerPoint presentation example of that. So it's basically going to be uh, the card is read by a point of sale terminal, talks to the acquirer, which talks to the bank, and that's uh, val validating that the card's legitimate, that the bank accounts are legitimate, and that the device, the point of sale system, or the actual ATM system is actually allowed on the network. So that all that process is going on in the actual transaction. And basically on step two is when this uh, actual attack happens. It gets passed off to, as you can see in that little green area there, it's actually getting passed off to the uh, ATM machine here. So uh, imagine uh, there should be technically about 3.1 transactions getting shot at this ATM uh, every time because of the size of the network and the blockchain. It is the only cash out device on the blockchain so it takes priority and it should be uh, getting nonstop transactions after I pop on the actual uh, Lakara system. So. And yeah, uh, how will you capture the pin? You have the chip. That's like one thing, that's half the battle. I was looking into some of the actual features uh, for some of the next generation ATMs and uh, they can actually change the pin on the fly uh, and some of them are unencry uh, unencoded or uh, actually unencrypted. So uh, there's the path methods of the past, there's the pinhole cameras that have been around for literally probably 12 or 13 years. Uh, there's the pin overlays, you'd be able to automate that. Uh, kind of the same way uh, as um, uh, the actual version that I've simulating the actual pin numbers here is uh, based on uh, OpenCV, which I will go into in a second here. So, and unencrypted pin traces. So, if it's actually reading straight mechanical data, it'll be able to grab the pins that way also. And uh, this is actually the method that I came up with because I was like, I want a way to 100% automate it. So, I actually got a, a keypad, then I uh, sp sprayed some 3M glue on it, and then I put a bunch of iron oxide, like very small pieces of metal, because I wanted to be able to get past the foreign object detection, you know, in this simulation. So that's something where I basically put a little, uh, little radio on the bottom of it and went through the actual key cycles, and it actually uh, basically has a different peak for each one of the keys, threw it into OpenCV, and now it's watching for those peaks. And uh, depending on the actual peak and the pitch on the peaks, it'll actually uh, tell you basically what, what key was pushed. So that was kind of like, you know, in addition to some of the overlays, which would be automatable, uh, it was something else that I kind of wanted to, uh, yeah, go into other ways of pin capturing. So, and that one was one that I hadn't seen before, and I loved playing with software-defined radios. I got a Edis N210 at the beginning, like right around Christmas time, and I felt like an 11-year-old again. So, if you guys aren't playing with software-defined radios, you definitely should be. So, they're amazingly fun. So, and yeah, so uh, aside from probing some of the networks, they're actually going to go into uh, the actual network and card settings. Um, 
they're looking at what the, like I said, they're collecting tons of data, they're setting, uh, they're uh, the bad guys are actually collecting, you know, what the, what flags are set, like what, uh, you know, what uh, limitations for per country, like what the actual attack surface will be once the actual mag, mag strip data d dries up, so. And this is kind of the direction that I saw uh, the bad guys going with this, so. And branch ATMs versus uh, on, ne on network ATMs. Um, anybody who's ever, you know, tried to get $500 and had to do it in two transactions, <laughs> that's an off network ATM. They like to uh, get some of the extra fees, it's just a little bit more risky, so they uh, break them down into several transactions. And the on branch ones are like the actual ones that are inside of the actual uh, banks and stuff like that. And I've, you know, personally I think I've taken out like, uh, you might have to adjust your point of sale limit, but you can take up to like two, three thousand dollars at a time from some of them, depending on your uh, years with your bank and things like that. But some of the off branch ones are obviously not the ones that would be attacked. So, and also this, uh, that was one of the first things I did after I bought my ATM is I actually converted it uh, to EMV. So that uh, is one of the only modifications uh, done to the actual uh, circuit board is it has the more advanced firmware that can handle the EMV compared to the actual old credit cards, so. And yeah, uh, Chinese and Japanese ATMs, ha uh, they literally have like $10,000 limits in some cases. So there are, uh, I think, uh, I forgot what the actual number was, but I, uh, yeah, it was several hundred that, uh, across the world that actually have $10,000 plus limits, so. And they're in limited portions, but uh, most of them are in Japan and China, so. And yeah, uh, as 2017's coming around, um, shimming of point of sale systems, uh, obviously they're gonna go for things that don't have a lot of the foreign object detection, that's something that, uh, yeah, it'll put an end to a lot of that, so. Uh, habits of putting EMV in early, what's a, like, if it doesn't have that piece of paper that it, whatever they put on it, like, you know, don't stick card in, no chip, or whatever, like we put our card in there and it literally takes almost an eternity, is what it feels like, so. That's one of the things where we want it to be uninterrupted, and uh, yeah, you can basically, uh, takes your point of sale limits, and uh, yeah, it, it's gonna be one of their favorite things to actually most likely do the same way that they do now, like a uh, majority of the actual cards that were skimmed are from the actual uh, uh, gas pumps, so. Yeah, I would just like to give special thanks before I kick off the demo, and then I will uh, answer some questions if anybody has questions, which they should have a lot of them, so. I'm gonna give a shout out to my wife, my kids, uh, Jesus, Barnaby Jack, uh, Sammy Kamkar, uh, a ton of the Cambridge guys, they did a really, really good job. Um, I got a lot of uh, buddies with some of the Arduino issues. I like to nest code sometimes and uh, they helped me fix it. So, yeah. And uh, I'm gonna go over the transaction because I am $1,800 short from my Black Hat demo. So, <laughs> as you can see on the bottom, uh, Benjamin Franklin is puckered, puckered lips. So, it is not real money. So, <laughs> and basically what I'm gonna go through, this thing's loaded to $50,000 in uh, fake, it's uh, not fake money, it's not fraudulent money, it's uh, actual for motion picture use and it has written all over it. I mean it looks pretty good from ten feet or from wherever you're sitting in the crowd, but it actually, you can tell from the bill on top it's not real, so. And uh, it's gonna grab the, uh, the PAN number and the uh, uh, bin number and actually go off if it's a five to nine hundred dollar per transaction. So it's gonna most likely go anywhere from zero to sixty transactions before it's actually either shut down for fraud or runs out of money, so. And uh, the transaction time is gonna take about 18 seconds. I'm gonna kick off the demo here and I will start answering questions. And uh, yeah, it's gonna enter the pin and uh, so basically uh, with the Arduino I needed to get it to a known state. So I need to make sure that it's on the right screen and then I can kick it off and it'll actually start pumping uh, transactions and it'll pump out different, uh, based on the actual uh, count number that comes into it, it'll actually pop out a different set of money, so. And hopefully I don't fall off stage, so. We're jackpotting them, so. <laughs> Woo. And I was scared my ATM demo was gonna blow up and the AV stuff uh, went crazy there at the beginning, so. But yeah, as you can hear, it sounds like rattlesnakes. Those are little Arduino servos actually entering the pin number, so. And hopefully the money is coming out good, so. But yeah, uh, 
does anybody have any questions? If you want to come up to the microphones, um, some of this is very, very ridiculous and you have to read about 1400 pages of some stuff but I will explain it to the best of my ability. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'll also be on stage. I just want to thank you all for coming. So. Thank you.